While most people in the world are forced to learn English if they ever want to leave their country for an international career, English speakers routinely visit other countries for leisure, not learn the language, and then get mad when no one understands them. English is such an influential language, in fact, that most people from English-speaking countries never even consider learning a second language to fluency. If we look at a map of Europe, we can see that the average person in Sweden or Norway knows 2.5 languages, Germany 2, the UK is trailing with 1.6, and America is still figuring out what a kilometer is. One redeeming factoid that I've heard quite frequently from English-speaking people is that English is one of the hardest languages to learn, which isn't true. And while I know that they just want to feel good about themselves, they should know by now that no one is allowed to feel good about themselves on my watch, especially myself. In reality, how hard a language is to learn is actually only really related to how similar it is to the language you already know. So for an English speaker, it usually takes about 600 hours of dedicated study and practice to reach conversational fluency in any of the Romance or Scandinavian languages, then around twice as long for Greek, Hebrew, or Slavic languages, then around twice as long as that again for Arabic, Japanese, Korean, Assembly, or Mandarin. So if you're learning English and speak any of those languages, then pretty much the reverse applies. What is true though is that English has quite a few quirks that make it easier to learn than other languages in some ways, and quirks that make it way harder as well. One of the best features of English is that we don't have masculine, feminine, or neutral. We just have the definite article, the the table, the refrigerator, and there are no regular nouns with gender, making English the ultimate safe space language. The downside, however, is that while I was trying to learn French, I would say, j'aime la chocolat, and people would say, le chocolat, le, the North Americans are so stupid. And that would hurt my feelings because I was trying my best. But when anyone is learning English as a second language and they say, uh, the chocolat, and then I say, the chocolate. And they're like, the chocolate. And I always think, not so easy now, is it, baguette boy? This is why you haven't been a world superpower for 300 years. What I'm trying to say is that while English nouns have no gender, the definite article, the, is a nightmare for most trying to learn it because one of the most difficult sounds to pronounce in English is the TH sound, th. I mean, not for me, I fucking nailed it, but for non-English speaking people who usually replace it with a Z, D, or an F. And if you've ever talked to someone learning English, you'll notice that one of the hardest words to pronounce is squirrel. Again, not for me, it's really just home run after home run. But if you're really looking to knock someone international down a few pegs, here's a few things that can be extremely hard to say even for English speakers. So when I put it on the screen, we can all try to say it at the same time. Anemone. Three thousandths. Rural Brewery. Thanks guys, I needed that. Additionally, in comparison to Romance languages, pronunciation in English isn't always consistent phonetically. As an example, in French you have bon, son, pont, font, but if you try that in English you get hat, rat, chat, wet. See, it just doesn't work. I mean, if you come across a word you haven't seen in English before, it's sometimes impossible to know how it's pronounced. Take these for example. Though, through, thought, tough, cough, plow, and sometimes you even have hiccups. Not me though, obviously, I never choke. Within English, there are also many dialects of the same language. For example, while American English is mostly removing redundancies in spelling and saying eggplant instead of aubergine or niche instead of niche, Again, basically anything that takes more power away from the French. British English removes a lot of redundancies from entire words. As an example, in American English you would say, I have to go down the elevator and get a ride so I can go and work out. But in British English you just say, I have to take the lift so I can get a lift so I can go and lift. And then in Australian English, they just completely change entire sentences in the most internationally destructive way possible. As an example, in Australian English you would say, Oi, don't you love it when a good cunt swore in a hot pair of thongs? And while most North Americans would say, oh my goodness gracious, Rachel, get the Bible, what that actually translates to in American English is, hey, don't you love it when your friend is wearing a cool pair of flip-flops? Ultimately, though, every English accent has its advantages and disadvantages. Jamaicans sound cool, but I can't understand them. South Africans sound cool, but I can't understand them. People from Scotland and Wales sound cool, but I'm pretty sure they aren't speaking English. And then people from America sound less cool the higher their neighborhood GDP. Even for me, I have possibly the most generic Pacific Northwest accent imaginable, meaning that I am never allowed to rap. And while that means I am unable to live up to my true potential, the upside is I can do this. Hey Siri, okay Google. Subscribe to Casually Explained. If that didn't work, you're lucky you're wearing headphones, because next time you have them out for 20 seconds, I'm texting your mom. I am just kidding, of course. I can already do that from my phone. Yeah.
Subscribe to Casually Explained. If that didn't work, you're lucky you're wearing headphones because next time you have them out for 20 seconds, I'm texting Check your mom. The oh, fuck. <laughs>